Keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast on our Instagram handle at the Wolf Connection Pod or email us your questions, comments, and guest ideas to podcast at wolfconnection.org. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. All right, two guests who we've had on before and really a lot of exciting research that's coming out of uh, Red Wolves, Ghost Wolves. Those of you that listened to our previous podcast with these individuals, uh, there's been a lot of uh, new new news stories coming out of uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States, uh, inside of Texas, Louisiana. And these two, along with their other uh, partners, um, are really done an exceptional job of bringing this to the forefront. So uh, we want to welcome back uh, Dr. Bridget Von Holt and Dr. Kristen Bresky. They are the director and co-director of Gulf Coast, the, the Gulf Coast Canine Project. Thank you both for uh, sitting here with Stephen and I. How are you both doing? Bridget, we'll go with you first. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm doing well. It's been a very busy month. And my semester started as well. So there's teaching and research and everything else, but I can't complain. That's good. Yeah. (laughs) Kristen, how about about you? How's everything? Yeah, same. A lot of stuff going on (laughs) with research and Gulf Coast canids and ghost wolves, but it feels really good. And like, there's like a lot of momentum and a lot of interest in the work. Um, it's just a lot because then you got to do your day job too of teaching <laughs> and all that good stuff. But no, it's it's good. It's good to be busy, right? Yeah, and I and again, I I really appreciate both of you. And and we got this on the books. I know you guys have been teaching and seminars and presentations and all this stuff. So it's really great to have both of you here. So uh, I'll start, Kristen. I'll I'll start with you, and then we'll go back and forth uh, with you and Bridget. Just give everybody an overall picture of. I guess what's been going on with Gulf Coast Canine Canine Project and Ghost Wolves at this juncture, because there has been a lot. Um, Bridget already put in our chat here, and and we are going to promote. They are doing a fundraiser for their research. So we will give you guys all the information for that once the the episode's posted. But if you're listening to this, um, please go ahead and do that now. Um, So Kristen, yeah, just a little bit of a background, where you guys sit right now on the project and, and why this is an important time for you guys to be speaking with us. Yeah, absolutely. So just like to take the step back of why are we here, right? So it's the rediscovery of this extinct red wolf genetic ancestry and these amazing animals that are now persisting along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and Texas. And so that's really focused us on Galveston Island, Texas, where we've been studying the animals on the island now since 2018 and like actively on the ground doing non-invasive research, going down and talking and giving um, town halls and engaging with the community. Um, We have a lot of exciting research in more rural areas in in southwest Louisiana, putting collars, GPS collars on animals and trail cameras and non-invasive work. And we're really ramping up our research to be studying not just the genetics of these animals, but also their full ecology, so understanding diet, understanding morphology, understanding space use, right? So we're we're like hitting the ground running. And in this process, we've become really enamored and see incredible value of Galveston Island in and of itself, the animals there, the people there, the ability to go and see the animals um, and hear them and have this kind of connection and this unique rural urban interface on a you know developed island but then there's these green spaces and this is what i think led to where we're at right now which has been a lot of work discussing and thinking about coexistence and better development because i'm not sure you can see the the zoom but the picture behind me is actually animals um an east beach pack on galveston island where there's a develop uh, Margaritaville being built, built right in kind of the core area of the um, East Beach Pack that we've been kind of studying, and you can go see and have kind of been a little bit of the flagship of some of the the, the visual aspect of what we do, and I I think that's what kind of just spiraled and got this ball rolling and got us down to do this town hall and built this kind of I would say a coalition 
our consortium. I think they're called they, they're, it's now called the, the Ghost Wolf yeah, Team. The Ghost Wolf Team. <laughs> yeah. That's what we are. Yeah. And and so I I I think that's where this is this been kind of this like building a momentum of the amazing um well I think you know selfishly the amazing research that we're doing has just once again become a little bit more visible. Yeah. I, I mean just discuss um because and again there were the three major points and the the three major news stories that I, I laid out that that I know we're going to dive a little bit deeper in with both of you here Bridget why is this so important because I know the the one of the first things I had there I I know there was development and there was a town hall meeting and and we'll get into all this it, the the first thing I saw there and reading through the article was the Galveston Coyotes carry this red wolf DNA why why is this so important and why is this happening in this specific area do you guys believe good question um a bit of the foundation for this is through some of the genetic sequencing that Kristen and i have been doing for a while it kind of started i think simply by my curiosity about coyotes Coyotes seem to be an understudied species, and, and yet we find them in every environment, literally every environment. <laughs> Deli case in a Quiznos in Chicago, for example. I love that story. But there's not really anyone doing a whole bunch of coyote genetics. I mean, there's, there's spots and patches of, of research, but I set out to really try to understand coyotes across the continent. And as I've been doing this genetic survey, we get access to some really interesting, unique coyotes. And during the same time is when a citizen scientist on Galveston, his name is Ron Wooten, had a story about the interesting canines living on Galveston Island and, and that they look quite different. And I totally agree. <laughs> they look entirely not like a coyote, and maybe like some other things, probably a red wolf. But red wolves have been declared extinct in the wild since 1980, when the US Fish and Wildlife Service went out and captured what they could find, the last remaining wild red wolves. And, and the places where you found those last wild red wolves was in the Gulf Coast area of East Texas and Southwestern Louisiana. And this was in the mid 1970s. So the Fish and Wildlife Service went out and captured the last ones. They ended up selecting 14 animals and the rest that they had kind of surveyed and evaluated. There's mixed stories about, oh, the rest of them had been destroyed or some were past reproductive age, so they were kind of released. It was acknowledged that there were hybrids as they deemed them. So red wolf, coyote kind of mixtures that were released back onto the landscape. But for the sort of the taxonomic record, a red wolf was no longer in existence in the wild. And that was declared as of 1980. So as, you know, fast forward to 20, 16, when Ron Wooten reached out and we got a couple samples, when we sequenced them and compared them, because the idea is we don't know exactly what this animal is from the Galveston um, coast, we could sequence it and compare it to everything else that it could possibly be. And it turned out to carry a surprising amount, which is essentially any amount of red wolf DNA. And, and that caught our interest. And we also wondered why, we you know, where the heck is this coming from? So a lot of the story is anecdotal at this point. How is that red wolf DNA still floating around? And we think a lot of it is because not every wild red wolf was caught in the 1970s. And the red wolf DNA in the 1970s had also found its way into local coyotes. And there's a lot of population dynamics that we could go into. As a species is declining, the probability that it would find a mate of the same species also declines. So when breeding season rolls around, pretty much anything that's closely related to you will do in a pinch. <laughs> and for a red wolf, <laughs> that could be a coyote, it could be a dog. 
Um, so if another red wolf is not available, hence those, those bits of red wolf DNA are transferred into the local coyote population, and they've been circulating around ever since. But that's not the whole story, too. And I want Kristen to take over about the green space stuff, if you want us to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So like it's right. So you have that there was this mixture of these animals, but you also have that combined with you can't go and trap every wolf like it's very hard. And there are some really amazing landowners and spaces um, across the Gulf Coast where they allowed wolves to persist. They allowed wildlife to persist without persecution. And so there were this is also sort of um, somewhat anecdotal, though now we're having we're getting more and more data to back this up, that there were spaces where there was by the nature of um, lack of access, essentially pr protection and preservation of the animals that were there. And those animals were mostly wolves, red wolves. And they have they likely persisted more into the future. And so we're finding these kind of hot spots of animals that retain a lot of red wolf ancestry. And you know, we're, we it, it, it creates this really beautiful juxtaposition of systems where we have pretty rural protected areas where there's not um, hunting access essentially through private land ownership as well as national wildlife refuges. Um, compose like kind of in juxtaposition to somewhere like Galveston Island that's like you know very open and developed but then even within Galveston Island it's very interesting because we're we're still figuring this out but there's some it, it seems to suggest potentially that some of these open green spaces were actually potentially retaining animals that might behave a little bit differently they might behave a little bit um differently in a way that when they're selecting mates and they're doing those things that lead to the next generation of the animals that they may have more red wolf ancestry and so they might be a slightly different animal in those green spaces than we see in midtown that's like a fully urban canid you know um but at the same time it's it is you do see this ancestry across galveston island and then we see it in these in high amounts in these kind of like hot spots of ancestry in these protected areas that animals weren't shot and persecuted essentially and that re remained in some big chunks of land and we think about you know in texas there's some big national wildlife refuges along the coast as well and these areas kind of buffered that extinction to some degree and here we are now you know 50 years later looking at what's left right this might be an obvious well this question might have an obvious answer but if well, like you said, the coyote populations are 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 understudied, which which I didn't know that I didn't know that that was the case. Um, but it but actually now thinking thinking of all of the interviews that we've done, it 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 seems very clear that that's true. They're they're for for an animal that's so abundant, for a species that's so abundant, it's been around. I mean, since the since the dawn of time, and it's it really does seem very under understudied. Um, which is really mind blowing now that I think about it. Um, so being that it's an understudied species and you guys are kind of grounded in this, in this one place that you're in, in this one location, this ghost gene, I mean, are there populations like very far from you that if you had access to them, you might find the same thing if you did that kind of research? I mean, how rare really is it? I mean, it's rare because it's rarely studied, but if you had to suspect, if you had to theorize on on how rare it really is, if you studied every coyote in, you know, some area, how how often would it? Do you think it would show up if you had access? All of them, or is it? No, yeah. So yeah. we've looked. I I I have sequenced thousands of coyotes um, because because I love it. They're such an interesting species, and I think they're written off quite readily as vermin and pests and and whatnot but they're really just a small wolf and unfortunately they were given a name that didn't have wolf in the title we seem to treat things you now eastern wolf gray wolf red wolf mexican wolf as coyote yeah and then there's coyote poor coyote yeah. why couldn't we just call it like a brush wolf or a prairie wolf which yeah so okay so i've already vented that at least the name is, needs to change um <laughs> as as I've looked across you know, North America, mostly the U.S., but a lot of the um, 
lower 48 states and sequenced coyote after coyote after coyote, the red wolf genetic signature is quite limited in the geography. Now, though, Stephen, there's a different aspect of this question, which is looking for red wolf DNA has a definition. I need to know what red wolf DNA looks like. And as we speak right now, there's only one definition on, on what red wolf DNA looks like, and that's any DNA that comes from the captive breeding population of red wolves all of which derived from 14 founders. So right. only 14 individuals that were captured in the 1970s led right. to how we define a red wolf. So finding red wolf DNA is a very different challenge or goal than finding ghost genetics, which is something that we don't quite know how to define it or call it. We're calling it ghost wolves because we have checked off every other box that it isn't. These aren't bits of DNA from dog. We've looked and we've checked. They aren't bits of DNA from gray wolf or Mexican wolf or Eastern wolf or other coyotes, North, you know, mid Midwestern coyotes, Northeastern coyotes, Western coyotes, you name it, I've checked it. Um, wow. I think, you know, <laughs> unless you come up with another mystery canid, <laughs> then, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe that would be the answer, but. Um, trying to define that thing that we don't know, but because we have a lot of that story, the, we know what was there in the 70s. We know how it disappeared. We know records of acknowledgments that there are red wolves in the 90s on someone's private property in Louisiana that no one really did anything about, probably because of limited financial resources or space. So we know that these animals were out there, but they never factor in to our definition of a red wolf DNA because they're not a part of the captive breeding population. And what we, I believe, what I think that we have is a new modification to the definition of a red wolf, but it goes, it predates the animals moved into the captive breeding program for red wolves. So it's an ancestral bit of DNA and I love the word ghost because it tells us, you know, it was something that existed. We thought it died out and it's kind of this disembodied version of something that we're trying to put a label now back onto it and naming things like that, especially when there's an endangered species involved is difficult. Yeah. And what would need to happen for you to, I mean, to positively connect it to some kind of ancestor or to, to define it? What, like what scientific miracle would need to happen for that to be easy? <laughs> I would say tomorrow? it's a bureaucratic miracle. Okay. I mean, one of, and I would say like some of the ancestors, oh, the way to like build the data to demonstrate the link to the historic, you know, the red wolf that was there, some historic DNA and historic museum samples that were, that we know are classified as red wolf from 1900 from Louisiana. And so it's kind of the next phase of some of the work we're doing mm -hmm. is help building up that historic reference population of um, what was there, you know, and because in 1970 to the eighties, like that was the advent of the molecular methods that we now take for granted to like define these things. And so we didn't, they didn't have that. And so some of those, some things, you know, um, Bridget has samples from the 1970s that we've sequenced and in, incorporated and, you know, we're learning more and more, but now we have all these amazing tools and techniques that you can get all sorts of genetic information from those historic samples. I see. That's wild. So with, with the picture that's behind you, Kristen, when you're talking about East Beach, why is it so go into this development aspect and, and I guess looking long-term, um, cause I'm reading through the stuff as you guys are, are chatting and just keeping myself in the loop when we're, when you're talking about the town halls that were happening to continue the discussion about this, these initial findings, obviously it's to continue the conversation is the ultimate end of the conversation to preserve, procreate, or, or is it really just about like finding the, the genetics out, what it actually means. And then going forward with that about what you need, what's, 
more obviously what's unique about this species that's on this part of Galveston Island and, and around East Beach. What's the mm-hmm. ultimate what's the ultimate aim as we as you talk with folks that are there, as you try to stop development and let everybody know, was that development stopped or are you saying it was it was happening? I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could start and I'm Bridget, maybe you can follow up with that harder of like what is the you know, what is the goal? I, I think when it comes to the development, it's not being stopped. We can't stop it. It's okay. legal, it is purchased, it's active. This picture is from I don't know, 2021, mm-hmm. maybe. Okay. And um there's a big crane on it right now. Oh, like no. if you went down the they're already building. Yeah. Exactly. Um and legally so, right? There's no legal okay. action. They're doing it by the book. Um our ask and our push is that it's done in a with the community and the wildlife in mind like there are strategies for developing for providing um corridors for you know doing native vegetation for doing bird friendly glass right there's strategies to have development and growth be done in a way that has some sustainability and has coexistence in mind in the community um, you know, biodiversity and also the human needs in mind. And so that's where we are sitting. We're not trying to stop economic growth or development as much as like, yeah, we'd love to protect all the world, right? Like, if, right. But, but there's a reality of this land's purchased. And so instead it is a discussion of how can it be done in a way that um, brings ecotourists to the island to care about the animals, to care about wildlife, to care about ghost wolves, but have that be an entry point to bigger questions and concerns and biodiversity conservation today, right? Um, and I mean, we've we've talked and it, it was a pipe dream of this discussion of we need like a ghost wolf education center. Well, there's going to be this Each Beach Lagoon um, Nature Center. So there's, like, there, there's real there there to try to push the idea of education, push the idea of sustainability and coexistence. And wouldn't this be an amazing opportunity for Galveston Island, these developers to be like, you know, a model of that. And so that's really where our discussion has been sitting. And to, I mean, does it look like it's going to happen? I mean, does it look like you're going to, there's some, there's going to be some kind of collaboration there or. I think there's a lot of conversation to still be had. Yeah. I think there's space for us to have that kind of positive um, presence, whether it's, just being able to advertise for our website where someone can learn more or more tangibly put up signage and have people at either Airbnbs include information, you know, in their little pamphlets to their to their guests or hotels who probably have some goal of educating their guests about local wildlife. I, you know, uh, it's kind of hard to know exactly especially when there's so many um cooks in the kitchen on who owns what and (laughs) who's leasing what to whom and what's their vision and mission for being ecologically and friendly and it's a part of i I mean i'm not a business uh major (laughs) i have no idea really i've been learning so much as we go um I wanted to get to some of like that, the John's question on the, the final or the ultimate goals, if I may. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's, I kind of separate the different hats that I wear. So the research, the research and professional goal, it'd be great, ideally, like if we could find some real hidden gems of red wolves out there, have them incorporated into a captive breeding situation, add new genetic diversity, expand the population, have a really hopeful future for red wolves existing outside of human care in a natural environment. That That's great. That would feel really good. Um, then the other hat is maybe a realistic or one that's more conserved in wishing um, in, and a lot of this being motivated by coyotes and and seeing every year how how hundreds of thousands of them being killed and stripped of their hide to be sent somewhere and or just recreational hunting and trapping and uh, 
my goal would be to show the value of something. A, we don't necessarily know um, if it's a red wolf or a coyote or some historic mixture of both. And it doesn't matter to me. It holds a very unique place in ecology and in genetic diversity. It's carrying something that is no longer there. Whether we call it a red wolf or a coyote, I, I don't care. The value is we are on their land and developing this Margaritaville and every other development that just wants to run you know, their pavement and streets through denning sites or butt up against a, a wetland. It's just not a smart thing to do, especially on a coastal floodplain when we really need that to buffer climate change. I mean, what, how quickly will this be flooded or <laughs> damaged with, Soon. yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what their plan is for that. Certainly coexistence is a really important way to for all of our decisions to be made. And I don't think we consider anything but a true, you know, a true species. And I don't know how to say that without getting into the the weeds of what admixture is and what hybridization means and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> I'm going to yada yada that unless someone really <laughs> wants to talk about that. Um, well, that's why ghost wolf is a great way to encapsulate the complexity without calling it a coyote or a red wolf, which has meaning and baggage associated with both of those terms. And um, I, yeah, I love, I love the way you phrase that Bridget of like wearing the different hats, right. Where we have our academic professional, like, desires that are we could very save the red wolf. How we... <laughs> we can genetically yeah. save it but i would be so yeah. much more thrilled if i mean and i've gotten so much more out of just being in galveston and hearing random people i do not know come up and say oh you're from out of town you should go look at our special fancy coyotes because we got mm -hmm. them here and i'm like oh i know about them to have that positive idea about a species that has been written off is just it just feels horrible to think that you know so much of the history in their DNA of the species. It just they deserve a whole lot more. And I, I really I feel like this system and the work that we're doing, and it's not just us, right? It's the people we're working with and the the interesting, like the community, the citizen scientists that work with us, up to you know um, biotech firms and federal and state agencies and private landowners and all these are really interesting amazing people from very different backgrounds and with very different goals all kind of in some capacity wanting similar things but in the end and it just feels in some ways like an opportunity to demonstrate in this system how to do it right how to like stem the biodiversity crises by bringing together modern technologies you know old-fashioned technologies of breeding animals together in a, you know, a, in a um, breeding scheme um, with, you know, different people from different backgrounds that are trying to do something for very different reasons that they all think is good, right, which is protecting this entity that is this unique to them, Texas or Louisiana entity. And um, I hope it, I hope this does, yeah, like, save the red wolf <laughs> and but at the same time i think it i hope it also is something that maybe could be exported as a way to to work across a bunch of different disciplines and a bunch of different people and a bunch of different um agencies to to protect something because you know we all we're all aware of the the challenges and the wicked challenges we face in the world with climate change and biodiversity loss and landscape loss and i i feel i I really feel like it, maybe one of the greatest contributions that we could maybe make with this system is showing how we can do something new and novel to to save something. I, I was reading the, the 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 location for this development. Some folks call um, Coyote Central, 
I think, or, or oh. at least I heard, I heard some people who, at least some people who live there, some of the residents have called it Coyote Central before. So I can assume the answer to my question, but I want to ask <laughs> y'all and see what, what you think. But if you can speak to the level of use this area experiences from wildlife and specifically the ones you're studying, I mean, is it a very central place for them? Is this going to, is how much of an effect really is, is development in this particular area going to have? Josh Henderson of Galveston Island, who's now the executive director of Galveston Island Humane Society. Um, he has some really wonderful infographics on, on this. Um, so, so the general answer is we know coyote, we know coyotes can move around a lot and long distances. One of the collared animals moved from Galveston all the way down to Port O'Connor, which was how many miles? The all in all, all the movement, if you stretched it out, went from like San Diego to Florida yeah. or something. So the, the, yeah. animal, the animal was bouncing around. So it went as far sort of south into Texas as Port O'Connor, but had done so much back and forth and up and down. And I think it, it walked, you know, like a whatever. It was it was a long ways. So technically, I think the answer is no, the development is going to displace the animals. The animals are going to go find somewhere else. They're either going to turn into the problem animals of downtown Galveston, right. which is also not a solution. Right. But um, it is also a problem because this is land that they are denning in. They live there. There's a pack that calls it home. And we just saw a pack of seven of them couple adults, probably some yearlings, just doing their coyote thing or their ghost wolfy thing. And um, they're going to have to go somewhere. And so it's, it's not quite, I don't know. It's not like a little frog that's purely restricted to the wetland that's going to be disturbed by human presence and boardwalks and whatnot. But it's just not setting an example that's valuing anything but paved ground and economic growth through short-term rentals and airbnbs and a margaritaville when you know if you have some corridors there then there's movement in and off the beach which is what these animals are using a lot of this land for there's there is an a east beach lagoon that's across the road that it is protected provides that is protected and might provide the type of space necessary to maintain those denning yeah. sites. Um, but if it's all, but then the, the amount of people traffic on top of that and road traffic, right? And a lot of these animals in the um, further west on the island get hit by cars. And so, like it, even though yeah, they'll they'll find they're gonna move somewhere and they will find space somewhere. But there's all these other compounding effects to it and. Some of that could be mitigated. That's what I think is the, I hope, I hope an outcome of a lot of this is that if you have some amount of corridors, if you have some amount of green space, if you educate people, if you put up signs, if you have, if you tell your guests not to be fearsome and that this is like a really exciting opportunity to see a really unique animal and there's road crossing signs or some ability to reduce traffic, like, right, like there could be ways to have a luxury resort and animals that still have what they need to persist there safely. Yeah. I honestly didn't even think about that part that, that they're going to be, that there's, there's going to be pushback saying like, well, maybe we don't want coyotes around our guests while we're, but that's yeah. another, that's, that's a whole other challenge, right? Because <laughs> fo folks associate coyotes a lot. I mean, particularly where I, where I grew up on the East coast with, with rabies for some reason, I don't know why that's ah. like, uh, you know, it's similar yeah. to raccoon. Yeah, I mean, where I raccoons grew up, man, if you see raccoons. anything during the day, it's a hundred percent. Everyone is that thing has rabies. <laughs> the animals are still alive during the day. You know that, right? They don't just come out at yeah. night. Um, <laughs> it's they got things to do too. Yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because he, Stephen and I, kept, we like we same come from area, basically yeah. we're like two st same area to like two states away, and it's really the same. They're like, oh my god, you see, there's like a family of possum that are running around. I'm like, yeah, so what? <laughs> like possum. Oh, my. <laughs> it's, but yeah, if, she, exactly. if someone saw yeah, a squirrel inside. like doing anything that was even remotely different than they've seen squirrels doing before, that thing had some vampire syndrome yeah. or something, some disease. You gotta be careful. 
I mean, mm. what's the, it's so funny how people view animals. I, I mean, it's, it's funny, but then it gets obviously into the situations that we're in with bigger predators. And you don't stuff know, like you that. don't know, I guess that's all. Exactly. W- what's the reception been like, I, I guess, community, like you've had a couple of town halls, you've had these meetings. I, I know there's bureaucracy involved with everything, as we all know, but what is the generalized, if you can put a generalization on it, uh, do we have two camps of people who say economic growth and, you know, we're not going to deal with stewardship and things like that. And we have people that are in the stewardship and, you know, recovery aspect. Is it, is it a basic two camps or is it kind of like the water's a little muddy right now because of how things are going right now with, with all the research and stuff? I think there's a lot of pro coyote, pro green thinking and pro environmental consideration. Um, But a lot of that also happens in a face-to-face meeting where maybe there's no need to follow up. If we feel satisfied with an in-person discussion, maybe there's hope that we're just going to leave it as, as that. So I, I think that there's, it's muddy. It feels like there's a lot of, um, comments about, yes, we are being good stewards and making avian wildlife protection plans for building designs, or here we we will have, I don't know, whatever else is discussed. We've delineated white wetlands and we're going to, you know, we're avoiding that. And, but also wanting to like help keep them to that and have the transparency. That's one of the biggest, um, another big concern is that the local community doesn't know what's going on and they only know when a crane is set somewhere or they're given 72 hour notice that there's gonna be a giant council, city council meeting to talk about some plan to do whatever development. So I think that the community has been, I mean, they've been voicing to us that they want to have a voice because it's going to be in their backyard, but no one seems to be engaging them. Um, and people can talk a good game in a meeting, in a face-to-face meeting. So I'm, I'm not sure what the outcome is going to be, but I know that, um, I mean, I'm post-tenure, I'll raise a stink as much as I can. I'm not really concerned or intimidated by being a vocal researcher in a community, um, not only for red wolves, but for coyotes and thoughtful or the lack of being a thoughtful member of this earth. <laughs> so it's, yeah, I, I, it's not an answer, but yeah. No, I, I hear you. I mean, it's, it's all about, it's all about making sure that everybody's voice is heard in that. Like you said, transparency is key. And I, I saw this, I see this on your website, which I, I love this. I'm going to read this. I think it's a couple of sentences, but through science and outreach, we aim to preserve native canines, their distinct genetics and the natural areas they inhabit along the Gulf Coast. Our vision is to develop regional pride while ensuring the persistence of red wolves into the 21st century through the revival of genetic ancestry found in Gulf Coast canines who continue to thrive in their native habitats. To me, that's it's a beacon of, again, having that conversation, but also I just love through science and outreach. Cause I think if you combine the two and you get the three of you, or well, when I spoke to all three of you at the symposium, cause Joey's not here, shout out to Joey. Yay, Joey. Joey. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Joey. <laughs> um, but it, your, your passion obviously carries through with everything you guys are doing. I, I love uh, or we love the work that you're doing. So I think that's a huge portion of it. So anybody who doesn't get to know you all just because of, you know, bureaucrat, you know, bureaucracies or politics or whatever it is, I think is missing out. And I think that's the major reason why, uh, again, uh, we, I reached out and I want to, I wanted to have you both back on to discuss this stuff because it's very important. I know there was development going on. There were town halls and we just know how a lot of that stuff, uh, uh flattens out. And, you know, it's news of the week and then it sort of dissipates. So I just, I want to keep it on there. You know, and like thinking about that, you know, politics and different, you know, camps and whatnot. Like, I think part of the reason we've been like 
I, I feel like been fairly successful this far, kind of moving the ball forward is like, Bridget and I will sit down and talk to anyone, right? Like it, we, there, we have no like- But you two are special. <laughs> John and Steven, yeah, you're yes, special. Yeah, so this is, this is really we special. We will talk to anyone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but not just anyone, but we are very open. <laughs> <laughs> not trying nope. to minimize this relationship no nope. it's really, nope. really nope. special you we've got it. something we don't have this is not common <laughs> we got something here well, i mean i, I saw it i had to go for it <laughs> that was low-hanging fruit that's all yeah that yeah. was yeah, yeah. Was, uh, but like we'll go talk to the fur bear association we'll go talk to the yeah. trappers we'll like and we're not trying to stop people's culturally important activities we're not trying to tell someone how to you know live their life right like we're just or that you can't you know walk your dog in this area or, or anything like that we're just trying to um have the conversation share the exciting information the distinct you know distinct aspects of these animals and um hear those different points of views because what we've heard you know, and it's not again. It's 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 not like an official so, social science survey, right? It's us talking to people, but across the political spectrum, people have different values and reasons for wanting these animals where they are. And this isn't a left or a right or a you know um, conservationist versus hunter. I mean, like none of it. It is a it is a mix. It's a cross section of people with similar goals, and and so I think that. Um, has been really interesting and, and helpful for understanding, you know, where some of these ghost wolf, coyote, red wolf advocates are coming from outside of us saying, you know, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's the, what are, what are the next steps for you all? Because I know, I, I think, I thought I saw Bridget, you were in Orlando. I, you were in I was, in I was I just know. at so, a conference. I, yeah. You were, you were. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you're at a conference. I mean, what's the, what are the steps for the next phase, I guess, of outreach? And I, I know we're going to get, I want to get to the fundraiser too, because we'll, we want to give everybody an idea to, if they, they hear this and they want to fund your research, which I don't know how you, you don't want, but you know, uh, we'll get to that. But what are the next steps in terms of outreach for both of you and, and the rest of, uh, of Gulf, Gulf Coast Canine Project moving forward now that, you know, development is going to happen in this place in East Beach. What, yeah, what just what are the tax going forward in terms of preservation and, and moving the conversation forward? We had um, a really good, I think, a really good meeting with the mayor of Galveston, who, again, in, in person, um, was incredibly receptive and even put forth an idea on having the city include some consideration and requirement of consideration for environmentally friendly designs for any project moving forward. Now, again, that excludes Margaritaville because they're already underway, but even just hearing that made me feel a glimmer of hope that perhaps the city will go through its bureaucratic process and include, even if it's a checkbox, do you have a wildlife protection plan in your, you know, whatever architectural design or whoever's buying the business or whatnot? And I feel like that it, we're going to follow up. And we've, you know, I've been sending things to the council members and the the candidates who are now running for election because Galveston has a city council election in May. So we're going to try, we're trying to like have everyone present their views and values of an environmental you know, I don't know, their environmental policies. Um, so we're, I'm constantly emailing people in the city, both of city government. And then the next thing is to connect with several foundations or other city organizations like their parks board. So we can hopefully have an in-person discussion on setting up an educational stand in the East Lagoon where People can learn about ghost wolf. So, and then, you know, the travel and tourism on the island, can we get more presence there as part of, you know, what they advertise themselves for? So the more we can help the city recruit the type of tourist that values um, like an ecotourism or just an environmentally friendly area, then I think that's doing some long-term 
growth of, of valuing something besides ourself and pavement. Um, we're working with other sort of NGOs around the state of Texas to try to think about, are there possibilities we could ever get money to buy land? And buying that land does seem like the most immediate way that we can keep existing packs with their habitat or just providing new um, habitat. There is an organization in Galveston that does buy land, but um, no one seems to be buying land in the area right now where the Margaritaville is in terms of keeping it undeveloped. So I don't know the prospects for that. It seems not so great. Texas did just have a Prop 14. Am I mix mixing that up with the Colorado Proposition 14? They have, it's called the um, Centennial State Park Fund that, I don't know if it was a million dollars put into it, but the state of Texas wants more, wants to build and, and keep state Park, new state parks in the state of Texas. Whether or not Galveston can have another state park on the island, because they already have one. But I think that some of that money, if, if residents of Texas can reach out to their state officials and city officials and start bugging the state, Texas Park and Wildlife, like, hey, we don't just need a big swath of land. We need this little you know, 90 acres right here it might be a patch, but you know what? We can have corridors that animals are already using. So it could still be quite significant. Um, well, Kristen also has this scat. Can so we talk about the poop? Because that's that. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we want to talk about the poop. Sorry, Kristen. I should have gone to poop first. <laughs> yeah. I think that's citizen science stuff, Kristen. Boy, I mean, I love, we often get asked, like, how can I help? What can I do? Like, can I volunteer? And it's like, we can't really volunteer to do genetic research, right? Like there's, that's a, it's a, it's a process and a skill set that you develop over time. But what people can do is people all over can pick up poop, right? Because you can identify likely to canid hopefully more wild versus dog dog poop looks different than wild you know canid poop uh and we're in the process of developing these non-invasive genetic tests to be able to look at some measure of sort of ancestry as well as individual id and population relatedness and things like that and I, I we love I love the idea of just when someone asked that I think we were we gave a, a presentation I don't know, a week or two ago and everyone's like I want to be on poop patrol yeah. right so like people are really excited about just being able to to be a part of the process and that would be real data for us if it's rolled out in such a way that's collected properly which is basically just don't touch it <laughs> <laughs> and um and keep it dry and mail it. And then we can start sort of building like a citizen science database, which in, in you know, my mind's eye of what would be the amazing next steps would be a beautiful website platform where people can see the results of these ancestry, combine it with diet and like other things that we can do once we have a, a scat sample in hand and um, maybe make an app, where yeah. like the poop app or something, you know, <laughs> the, the crap. <laughs> The crap. Yeah, that was a, a colleague of mine at the at the uh, National Park Service, uh, Royal National Park Service. Uh, that was his idea. He wants to do it on the park, and he's like, "We're gonna call it crap. And it's gonna be an app. It's like a picture of the crap, and uh, you know, so the data is immediately populated into a spreadsheet, and like, you know, that type of a thing." So I mean, I, I think we're gonna we're like we're working to unroll all that. It just all takes you know a little bit of time for the um the organization of it. But that'd be a really amazing outreach tool combined with the collection. Do you guys ever talk to the developers directly of the, of these kinds of projects or Yeah, we had a meeting. So when you're talking to developers or like you were saying you you're you're always kind of reaching out to local officials when you're trying to have these kinds of conversations I mean I I know that with 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 folks who are business minded specifically you sometimes you have to speak their language a little bit or you have to you have to figure out what's important to them because they have zoning permits to worry about and inspections and they have timelines and if they don't get it finished by a certain time they got to wait for another permit they got to wait for 6 months they have a lot of things going on pertaining to this project and and it may be hard to communicate 
well, the e- the local ecosystem, you know, you need to factor that into to what's going on right now and, and the money that you have on the line in this investment, et cetera, et cetera. So when you're talking to these these folks on why it's meaningful to initiate something like a built-in requirement for for developers that says they 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 will consider these local eco- ecosystems. How do you sort of formulate that messaging in those kinds of arenas? Um, I would say that I'm developing those skills right now, but m- most of it um, comes from finding really good mentors and other groups that engage in this regularly. So for example, um, the International Wildlife Coexistence Network, uh, Suzanne Stone is heavily involved and I've already learned so much from her and she helps translate, not necessarily everything that Kristen and I wanted to say, but translate the needs to knowing what we can anticipate from developers, what's gonna come out of their mouths versus a mayor or someone else. Um, Also working with uh, the Texas Conservation Alliance and John DeFilippo and the Galveston Bay Foundation, Bob Stokes, they're all very well seasoned people who do this as their career. So much of it is, I believe, Kristen and I making new friends, taking taking um, signals from them as leaders and being able to add our portion in that conversation. Um, Although sometimes I find that most people have pointed to me at the table, Bridget, Bridget's leading this. Bridget, you do the opening. (laughs) I'm like, okay. (laughs) Bridget has been amazing. She has been the leader of this group. She's brought all these really, truly amazing people together. And then, and then she's done it. Like it is, it is, she is the leader. Don't let it be like (laughs) modest because she has, it's been impressive to see her skill set develop into being the point of contact. Uh, But I think part of it though, is that there, there are those like, like, almost political conservation leaders in the background that provide that context. And like our context is like, we're scientists and here we are telling you this value and importance. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that's the other thing. Um, it hasn't been so salient before, but, but people comment on, oh, you're, you actually will say something. You will have a public comment. You will go on a podcast. You'll go in the local news. You'll, and and you know, I never thought that that was, I don't know, unique, but it seems like people notice that. And you know, that truth be told, part of the reason Ron Wooten got to be involved in this way is because I believe I was really the only one who responded and said, "Oh, I'll do something about this." Other people sort of hemmed and hawed over email and gave ideas but didn't have, I don't know, an action plan. And, and I, I was like, fine, I've got a very easy action plan and I'll do it. <laughs> and, and then I kept you know, in contact with Ron and we sent him results and updates and I'm pretty sure he's a co-author on the paper actually. In the first paper, yeah. yeah. So uh, he kind of helped us the first time we went to do field work was Ron showing us around and like me- making the connections with Josh Henderson, who has been a key yeah. p- part of all of this. And like, I think it comes down to, we'll talk to anyone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Having that. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm for whatever reason, I'm not intimidated or afraid to, to be public. Um, um it, the feelings that well, I have too you, about it. Use it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great skill. I mean, it's honestly a great attitude to have because if you, you know, if you're not afraid of it, then it it just it I think it breaks down any kind of barrier or things like that that you know, if there's anything that's that's standing in the way of having the conversation, it just sort of melts it away. You're like, "Oh, okay, we're you're open to having a conversation with whoever it is." Then then that just moves it along. And I think that does help also show a that scientists are people. I do have feelings and I'm allowed to have feelings about whatever I'm working on. And, um, and also see (laughs) that I think having the scientist 
break down the complexity of what they're doing and what they're finding and its long-term impact of their research. Having the scientists do that about their own work is far more meaningful. Hearing it come out of their mouths, although I do think they have to practice it, and I don't always hit it on the head, but I do think that the more time someone talks about their work, the better they get at, at describing it in a way that doesn't feel condescending, but also feels very exciting. Yeah. And that's, we, to me, passion about your work or about whatever the, the goal, the, whatever it is that you're talking about, to me, shouldn't resonate as, like you were saying, like a demeaning thing. And that's, the, I, you guys have oodles of passion just <laughs> for all, for this project and for what you've I built and to, all that stuff. I had, and it, it doesn't diminish the science. Like, I think that people are afraid that, oh, your science is biased or someone's going to say you're, I don't know right. what, like an right. advocate, like that shouldn't be a bad word. Like, yeah. I forgot to yeah. shout out yeah. it, no, Renee Secor also from Project Coyote mm -hmm. has been heavily involved and Regan Downey from Wolf Conservation Center. They've been, they've been key players in helping us know how to have these discussions and, and what's the content to come with in, and then bring in some maybe, you know, the, the trailing end part of the conversation once the door is open. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot. It's always good. It's always good to have partnerships. It's always good to have people that are are allies in, in a way that, that you can help navigate all this stuff. Because like you, you I'm sure that both of you and, and everyone else has, has noticed that it's a multi-tiered, multi-faceted. It's not just a straightforward, hey, let's have this conversation about it. You got to think about all the things that are involved. Um, what is the best way, Kristen and Bridget, for people to learn uh, more information about every everything that's upcoming, where you guys may be headed next. Um, what's I know if you haven't visited their website, website GulfCoastCanineProject.org, uh, it's great. Um, anything else that that I'm missing that you guys uh, would point people to? I will say I won't speak for <laughs> Kristen. Um, I am very happy to get any emails of questions or inquiries. I'm happy to have them. I will, I will again, talk to anybody. <laughs> I will respond. I think that's super important. It's a value. I, I really value that as a scientist to be reachable. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, you can find my email on the Gulf Coast Canine Project website. You can also look me up at Princeton. I'm there. You can find my email that way. Again, I'm not hiding. And if you see an animal or you want to share an experience or, you know, it's, I value that. That's how we met Ron. Yeah. I love it. I am not as good at responding <laughs> to my emails. <laughs> not from a lack of caring and passion Justin and wanting has, to communicate. I'm just, you're busy. <laughs> I'm busy. I can currently hear my children running up and down like the hallway outside my office door. <laughs> <laughs> um, my my very young children. Um, but I, yeah, our website is definitely where we're trying to like put our information. We're working on like being um, more timely with newsletters and things like that. So I would say more is to come, mm -hmm. right? Or I um, in the sense of that communicative communicative outreach component, because like I said, I feel like it's just like the ball started rolling again, and I think we're you know kind of amping up. So. Um, keep that going we're gonna get our social media going at some point <laughs> not <Yeah>. me <laughs> trust, trust me we know no, 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 not me either i'm gonna grad student <laughs> there you go it, yeah i know it's a bear to do all this stuff uh real quick tell everybody too about this this fundraiser yeah. uh because i know you put it in our chat but how yep. can people is, can you get to the fundraiser through the website or another way okay you can okay. Yep, you can. I, there's a little box if you just go to the home, the landing page of Gulf Coast Canine Project org. It is essentially buy a hoodie, help a ghost wolf. I think the hoodies are thirty five dollars. They currently it's only uh, a one color scheme, but um, once that that fundraiser, we'd like to have fifty hoodies purchased. We're halfway there. Um, we've got another twenty five days for this fundraiser. Um, once that's done, I'll either start another one or we'll be able to add this kind of merch. We do have merch on the website. It's just 
not in the wonderful rainbow of colors that <laughs> I like to wear. So I've been trying to beef up the the color combos. Um, so yeah, you can find out at, at the Gulf Coast yeah, Canine Project yeah. org. I love that. I do want to thank you both for letting us be on, especially I just saw that Carter Niemeyer was on, or at least you just, you know, dropped that a few with him. That interview. All, Carter's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, the appreciation that you're spending time on ghost wolves when in fact, gray wolves have just received a major blow to them in the past week. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to be here, but also you got to keep fighting for those gray wolves. This is a problem. <laughs> this is a huge problem. I mean, listen, you, you're all, everybody who's, who has come on this, this podcast, yourselves included, are all involved in the same sort of conservation, preservation, research, getting information out there. So everybody's included. Um, and it's, it's really a privilege to talk to both of you because you're, you really have incredible information. You're doing amazing work. And it, it's always good to reconnect with people that we've spoken with before, because that means that things are moving forward. And to me, that's, that's the best part is that, you know, we, we could talk to some people maybe once and we never talk again for various reasons, whatever that may be. But it's, it's always good when I see action items coming through my email, Bridget, because she, she sees me on some stuff and I go, I have to contact Bridget and Kristen again because stuff is happening. <laughs> so I appreciate you keeping us in the loop and doing all the stuff you do. Um, so anybody who's listening, we will have the, oh, I, I think we'll be, we'll be able to have the, uh, the website in the description. Please go to their website. Uh, their social media, uh, is there, but I, like they said, they're working on it, but please look into their, their stuff. Uh, it's valuable research. They do amazing stuff. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bridget von Holt, Dr. Kristen Bresky. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work. And uh, you guys are awesome. You guys are a lot of fun. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I can't wait to come back again. <laughs> <laughs> come back again. There's always maybe, something new. Oh my God. Maybe goodness. next time when we like find a red wolf in the wild or yeah. put one somewhere because we have it. Yeah. There's there. This is the year mm -hmm. of the red wolf. I'm convinced. So put us on the books for like six months. I'm sure there's going to be. Yeah. And big. after the, the uh, sure. you know the development is finished. You know it'd be nice to know what's going on after that. Yep. So yeah. Yep. Definitely. I think we'll have some research results in the next six months. Yeah. Love it. Thank you both. Uh, how's to y'all out there? And we'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking for more information about Wolf Connection or the podcast? Please visit our website at wolfconnection.org, where you can donate, sponsor a wolf, or become a volunteer. <laughs>